Hi, my name is Paul from High School Physics Explained and today it's going to be a little bit of a different where we're going to do a collaboration between Crooked Science and the University of Sydney. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Dr Simon Crook from Crooked Science. And I'm Tom Gordon from the School of Physics at Sydney University and we're in the wonderful second year teaching lab that we use for kickstart science. And today we're going to be looking specifically at Millikan's oil dropping experiment and we're going to examine this in two ways. The first way we're going to be specifically looking at how it is taught at the high school level but we're also going to dig a little bit deeper how Millikan actually performed his experiment. So tell me, uh, what is Robert Millikan's experiment all about? Well, uh, firstly Paul, um just stepping back historically, uh, in 1897, J.J. Thompson determined the specific charge of an electron or the charge to unit mass ratio. But it wasn't until 1909 uh, where Millikan and Fletcher actually determined uh, the actual charge on an electron and demonstrated that it's actually quantized. So, in terms of the equipment, um, I should I should hand over to Tom, seeing that it's his equipment. <laughs> so, this equipment is, uh, is a fairly... Uh, uh, this equipment is pretty recognisable to some students and teachers. It's different to the experiment that uh, Millikan did, uh, but it's a pretty accessible version of the experiment. I'll just point out some of the, the uh, parts of it. This here is the light box, and that just shines a light into the chamber in here where all the action happens. This is a telescope so we can see what's going on, and I've connected a webcam that's going straight onto this screen here. Uh, the pipe that comes in here is connected to uh, a little pump that has some silicon spheres in there and when I squeeze that the silicon spheres will go through this pipe here collecting charge as they do into the chamber where we can measure the voltage on each of those charges or on some of those charges. That's very simplistic but that's basically the setup. In essence what we're going to do initially and Tom is going to uh, show us uh, how it's actually performed and onto the screen but what we're doing is we're suspending these little uh, spheres in an electric field. That is, they experience a force and they'll be experiencing a force upward and that is counteracted by the force of gravity. And by balancing those two out so that you have basically a net force of zero, you're able to, to uh, by looking at the voltage, you're able to determine the charge that is on that sphere, but you know the size of the force that that charge is experiencing due to the fact that it is counteracted by the gravitational force. So Tom, do you want to take us through it? Yeah, sure. So uh, here, is the, here is the chamber. It's nothing special, but here's the chamber where I've got a little bit of uh, the silicon spheres. That's going to get air pumped through it when I squeeze this and what you'll, sh what you'll see hopefully is a bunch of little dots on the screen. Uh, we'll do that now. There you go, you can see the little dots on the screen and some of them are hovering, some of them are going down. The ones that are going down are falling through the electric field with gravity and the ones that are falling up are falling through the electric field against gravity. What we can do is I'll just squeeze some more in there so we can see there's some lovely ones there. What I can do is change the polarity of the electric field and you're going to start to see some of these things move up and some of them move down. Oh, you can see that one up yep, there. there, you there go. There's that's one that's going one. down. Yeah, and reverse them. Yeah, that's a good one. So what we can also do is change the, uh, the, the strength of the electric field by changing the voltage here, which I'll do. So you might be able to get a few of these things to hover. All right, there's one that's kind of hovering. Then we change the field, goes up, change it again, goes down. So now let's have a look at the physics of balancing the force due to the electric charge and the force of the gravitational field. So here's a picture of Robert Millikan and the device that he used to determine the charge of the electron. And here is a simplistic diagram of what Tom has already explained to you. So we've got here a bottle that sprays oil. We used, of course, the beads. And one of these beads falls in between two plates, which has an electric field between them. And these two plates are separated by a certain distance. And these oil droplets do get a charge. They can actually be hit with, let's say, x-rays to produce uh, charges on them. Or in the case of our setup, we had simply passing through the tube, they automatically picked up some charge. And then of course we have a scope that allows us to observe these droplets as they are suspended in some form in between the two plates. And now let's have a close look at a simplistic 
way of determining the charge on our particle. So I have my charge here that is going to drop through the field here. And this charge will experience two forces. And the first force is its own weight. And that weight will pull it down in the influence of a gravitational field. That's what the little G stands for. Then if we apply an electric field, then we get a force in the opposite direction. And in this case, we're getting a more negatively charged V and it's going to be attracted towards the positive plate. Now, as alluded, we are making some assumptions here and that is we know the mass of our particle. So this example here assumes that we know the mass. So what is the mathematics involved here? Well, first of all, you know that the electric field that applies is equal to the amount of voltage that you apply between the two plates divided by the distance. So you know the electric field. Secondly, the force that we have, that is the force due to the electric field, is simply equal to EQ. And therefore the force in terms of the electric field is equal to VQ over D. Now what about the gravitational force? The gravitational force is simply equal to mg, and g being in this case the acceleration due to gravity, and m is the mass. So again, I want to make the point here is that we are using this setup in terms of high school physics that the mass of our little bead is known. Now what we can do, of course, is suspend this oil droplet in between these two. So these two forces are now equal. That is, the net force is zero. And so what we have is VQ over D, that is, uh, the force due to the electric field, is equal to MG. And so therefore Q ends up being very simply equal to MGD over V. And that, of course, is for any specific known mass. At a high school physics level, um, we make a few assumptions to make things more um, attainable for students. And the assumptions that we make are around the mass of the um, actual particles. So the oil drops in uh, Millikan's case and the silicon uh, spheres in, in our case. So for the equations and the solutions, as you're doing with Paul, um, the mass is given so that we can actually determine the fundamental charge. However, the overall experiments that uh, Millikan performed was a, a tad more complicated. The complications came from all the different uh, assumptions that, that we are making in this experiment, as Simon was saying. Uh, things like uh, the density of the oil drops and the, uh, the viscosity of air, etc. And because we've made all these assumptions, we've skipped the fact that uh, what Millikan was actually doing was measuring the velocity of these things, the terminal velocity of these oil drops or silicon spheres through the electric field in that chamber, which has a certain viscosity based on the size of it, the temperature of the air, uh, the temperature of the experiment inside. So when you uh, measure these, the, the values for terminal velocity, adding in all these other uh, factors that we've assumed, this is where you get the value for, for charge with a complicated calculation. By determining the mass of the individual particles. Correct. Now the way Robert Millikan did this experiment, as alluded, is that he did not know the mass. So how could he design the experiment so that he could also determine the mass? All he did know was the density of the oil, but then he also needed to know what the size is of the oil. In other words, how do you determine the size of the oil droplet? Because that would be, of course, a factor in the mass of the particle. What he did was he determined the velocity of the particle when it was going up and the velocity of the particle was going down. And in both cases, the velocity is constant. There's no acceleration. So the forces acting on the particle, whether it's going up or whether it's going down, are going to add up to zero. It is important to remember though, when we are talking about the oil droplet going down, Robert Millikan was observing it going up simply because he was looking through a microscope. So therefore the image is inverted. So that's an important aspect of his experiments just to be, to be aware of that. What we see as going down, he saw as up and vice versa. 
Now, how did he determine the velocity? Well, that's very simple. So the velocity is simply the displacement divided by the time. So we had a grid so he can measure the distance that the oil droplet moves and measure the time that it moves up and down and thereby determine the velocity. And of course, he had two situations. The first situation was where there's no electric field and therefore the object will just fall down at a constant velocity. So here's my oil droplet or my bead and it is going down at a constant velocity. And there are three forces at play here. The first force is the force due to gravity and that is equal to the mass times the acceleration. But of course, we don't know the mass. The second force at play is the buoyancy force. That is, there is a certain amount of support on the bead by the surrounding air. And the third force is that because it is moving, there's a drag force, or let's say what we will often refer to as simply as air resistance. But now what we have is the case with the electric field applied, and now it's rising at a constant velocity. So here's my bead, and it's moving upwards. And we still have the force due to gravity acting down. We now have also the electric field being applied. We still have the buoyancy force, which is in the upward direction still, but now the drag force is in the opposite direction. In both these cases, the factors are involved here are the size of the droplet and the mass, and therefore, we now have the ability to analyze this and determine the mass of the object. I will again stress that the mathematics that I'm about to show you is not examinable at a high school level, but it's helpful to see the process that Millikan took. The first thing is the force due to weight. Of course, we said that is equal to mg, and the mass is equal to simply the volume there's the 4 thirds pi r cubed multiplied by the density of the oil. The second equation that is helpful is the buoyancy force. In this case, the buoyancy force is equal to the volume of the sphere, but this time it's multiplied by the, the density of the air multiplied by g. The third formula is the drag force, which is the frictional force. And that's equal to 6 pi r eta v and eta is the viscosity of the air and v is the velocity. So you can see where the velocity now comes into play. When you combine all these things together, you end up getting a value for r with this equation. And then ultimately, doing all the mathematics that we've talked about, you get a value for q. And you can see it's a quite complex formula, well and truly beyond the scope of high school physics. But nonetheless, Millikan was able to determine the charge on his bead. Now, he did this many, many times. So the important thing here is we don't actually know how charged each particle is. But as these particles go through, as Tom was describing, some of them pick up multiple charges. So when they're in the electric fields, they will feel different forces. So Millikan had to determine the voltage at which the force of the electric fields would balance out the force of gravity for each of the particles. So it was a massive data collection exercise, which um, is very impressive over 100 years later. Mm. Now, what were Robert Millikan's results? Remember, he measured the velocity of individual oil droplets multiple times. That increases reliability in both the direction of up and down with the electric field and not with the electric field. Then it measured multiple different oil droplets with different masses and therefore had different charges on them. And again, he measured them multiple times. He collated those results and he analyzed them. Now, the way I'm going to analyze them here is not exactly the way he represented them, but the essence is still the same. When he graphed the results, he noticed this trend. Removing any particular outliers, he noticed that the charges of each of the oil drops seem to clump into discrete regions. In other words, we say that it seems to be that the charge is quantized. Now, what does that mean? It means that the charge on each of the different oil droplets seems to be a whole number of some sort of elementary charge. So in this case here, our n value is going to be one. 
In this case, our end value is going to be two. This area represents twice the amount of charge in this area. Here we have three and four and so forth. He determined that the elementary charge here was of the order of 1.59 by 10 to the power of negative 19 Coulomb. Now that is surprisingly close to our now accepted value of 1.602 by 10 to the power of negative 19 Coulomb. So he got the result with an extremely high level of accuracy. And a number of years later, he received the Nobel Prize for Physics for his results. Okay, so uh, Millikan determines that the, uh, the, the charge on an electron was 1.59 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Now, if we achieve that in our laboratories uh, in schools, we'd be very happy with a result that's so close to the accepted value now of 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Um, however, that tiny, tiny difference um, wasn't actually that tiny given the, uh, the quality of Millikan's data. And the, the reason for what was later determined to be quite a big difference uh, was because he had an incorrect value for the viscosity of air. So that wasn't his fault. With the data that he had, he had amazing results. But there was a bit of controversy afterwards. Um, some people said um, that he was fudging his figures, that he was being selective in his data. He didn't use all the data in his actual notebooks. Uh, but what he was doing was that he was only using valid data. Where he determined that uh, some of the data um, was acquired where it wasn't a controlled experiment, perhaps where some of the variables had changed, uh, he didn't, he discounted that data. So that's good science. So where there was controversy uh, was with some of the scientists that came after Millikan. Uh, now this was uh, actually covered in a very famous address by uh, Richard Feynman, um, I believe it's at Caltech in 1974, where he discussed the fact that some of the scientists that were looking to repeat Millikan's experiments or similar experiments to work out the charge on an electron they didn't actually publish all their data objectively. They thought, because their results seemed to deviate quite a bit from the value that um, Millikan achieved, they, fud they did fudge their figures so that, such that their overall result was closer to Millikan's results. And over time, with just regular intervals, we finally got closer and closer to what is now the accepted charge on an electron. Now that isn't good science, you know, that's a shameful part of science history. They held Millikan's results in such high regards, they didn't want to deviate too far from it. The fact was, as was mentioned before, Millikan had an incorrect value for the viscosity of air. So those follow-up scientists should have published their data honestly, um, and that's a good message for everyone out there. Well, I hope that's helped you understand Robert Millikan's experiment with determining the charge of the electron. Thank you to Simon for Crooked Science. Thank you to Tom from the University of Sydney. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Well, I hope that helps you understand the concepts. Thanks for watching. Please remember, like, share, and subscribe. And by the way, drop a comment down below if the video particularly has been useful. And finally, consider supporting me via Patreon. The idea is to develop resources and equipment to continue to teach physics at a high school level. I'm Paul from High School Physics Explained. Bye for now.